Support this podcast via our Patreon and get more writerly goodness. Visit patreon.com slash nanocast to join up. Welcome to NaNoWriMo Every Month. My name is J. Daniel Sawyer. I'm the author of some 20 books, 34 short stories, and numerous articles and other things. And I am your guide on this journey to use NaNoWriMo to level up to professional output levels. Welcome to The Questions, Episode 22. Today's question comes from that perennial wonderful questioner, Sergeant Mike, who asked a couple of questions which seem to me to go together. He says, How do you develop the setting as its own character with all that implies? When I write, I tend to find I either spend too much time writing my world building or leave the reader having to do it themselves. And he also asks, World building. How much is enough without giving too much and losing the plot and the reader? I struggle with giving too much, effectively spoon-feeding the audience and giving them room to create their own mental image. Okay, so, uh, Mike, these are very connected because the principle that answers both of them is the same. You basically want to create a world that is complete enough for your story to take place. If you're going to do a lot of more in-depth world building because you're building a series, or for your own sense of grounding, or to satisfy a psychological eccentricity or something, that's a whole other thing. But at the very minimum, you need to build the set that your characters are on. If you ever go to Universal Studios and take the backlot tour, whether in Hollywood or Florida, you'll notice that they've got a whole bunch of buildings that aren't buildings. They're just the fronts of buildings. And if you go around back, they're just a bunch of two-by-fours holding up the fronts of these buildings. They're called facades. They serve exactly the purpose that is needed, no more, no less. And that's the minimum level of world-building work you need to do. Now, it sounds like from the way you pose your questions that you're struggling with doing the opposite. You're struggling with being completely complete and then, instead of telling a story, just taking your reader on a tour of your world. This is where the um, old maxim, setting is character, comes in. Your reader encounters your setting through the eyes of your narrator. And unless you're writing third-person omniscient, which is a very rarefied art form and isn't practiced very much today, then your narrator is going to be peering through the eyes of one of your characters, or more than one of your characters. So what your audience encounters is going to be what that character notices about the room, the street, the world. You need to have them notice enough that your audience stays grounded and one step ahead of the dialogue. You don't want someone walking into a room and saying, The Mertzes are coming, with having no idea what the Mertzes are, unless you immediately make it clear with the reply whether the Mertzes are an invading army or a species of birds that's coming on a violent rampage to a coastal town, or they're the rival clan, or... Whatever they are, you need to make it clear to the reader so the reader can follow along and sometimes anticipate what's coming on. You don't want them to anticipate all the time, just some of the time. You know, it lets them feel invested, and investment's a good thing. But um, if you're losing the plot, then probably what's happening is you're not confident about the story you're telling, and so you're retreating into something that you know. Now, if you're a young writer, and by young I mean young in your career, You're going to do that. It's natural. And as you cycle through, one of the things that you'll begin to notice is when you're doing that, and you just are going to probably become a taker-outer and cut sections as they become obvious to you that they're not important. Think of your narrator's voice as a camera lens. Your readers cannot see what you don't point your camera lens at. They don't see anything that's not on the screen. It's just like shooting a movie that way. No one who's watching a movie, not even people who make movies, when they're watching the film are thinking of the crew that's behind the camera. The sound guy, the craft services table, the lighting rigging. No one's thinking about that. They're thinking about what shows up on the screen. Even if they're watching it critically, they're thinking about the artistry of what's on screen, not about the massive, unshowered, harried, ungroomed people sitting behind the camera going, yes, yes, okay, good, now give it to me again with more emotion. 
They're thinking about what they're seeing on the screen. That's the same as your readers. Your readers don't give a damn about what's in your head, unless you're talking about a literature class and they're trying to deconstruct you, in which case that's their hobby and they're always going to be wrong. And I say this as someone who's done a lot of deconstruction in my time. And they're worth ignoring. Almost no one is going to be thinking about what was in your head. They're going to be thinking about what it is you're giving them, because that's what's in their head. You um, talk about spoon-feeding the audience, as opposed to letting their imagination do the job. This is a false dichotomy, and you need to drop it now. It will screw up your writing in so many ways. When you think about spoon-feeding your audience versus letting them get their own mental image, it tells me something very specific about you. It tells me that you loved to read as a kid. And as you loved to read as a kid, you tended to read books that were beyond your comprehension level. You grew because of the books you read. But you also fell in love with that sensation of mystery, like you know, they were using words you didn't quite know the meanings to, and they were invoking adult dynamics that as a child you didn't have experience with. And so you're used to a feeling of mystification being attached to a good read. That is an artifact of being a precocious reader. It's not what a good writer does. Go back and reread some of those books that gave you that feeling as a child you'll discover that they're terrifyingly clear most of the time in what they're doing. Some of them you're even going to be able to see the furniture move. The experience that you're sort of instinctively trying to recreate by making your audience form their own mental image is an artifact of a failure on your part as a reader as a very young person. That's not a moral failure, it's just a technical failure. You weren't old enough to understand everything that was going on. That's okay. But trying to recreate that in your reader is going to make readers put your book down. Spoon feed them the setting. For heaven's sakes, if something's going on, paint the picture in their mind. Give them the full sensory immersion. Let the story wash over them. Because when they are sucked down deep into your story, they will go anywhere with you. And if you're making them fight to get in, a good percentage of them are going to give up and go somewhere else. Just give them the world through the perspective of the character so that you're doing double duty. You're explaining what's around and you're illuminating the attitudes and priorities of your characters. Don't put them in a white room. Stories that are in a white room that work are very hard to do. There's a lot of things you do early in your career that are impossible to do well until you do them late in their career, which is why they become those things in the mid-career that you avoid like the plague, because you've seen them and done them so badly, and everyone tries to do them because they're so cool when they come off that everyone tries to do them, and they're terrible. And then occasionally a Stephen King or a Neil Gaiman, or a Stephen Donaldson, or someone with an ultra-advanced set of writing tools will do this thing, and it will work brilliantly, and then a new generation of new writers will all try to do that thing, and it will suck. That's because the thing that we're all trying to imitate is not the thing that they actually did. We're trying to mimic the effect that they had on us, and we don't understand how they did it. Your world-building needs to be complete enough that your characters are moving around in a space that appears real. And you need to give your audience enough opinionated and concrete detail. She was wearing patent leather buckled biker boots rather than she was wearing shoes. Shoes could be anything. Patent leather buckled biker boots are a very specific kind of thing. Combat boots, a very specific kind of thing. East German army boots, very specific kind of thing. The point at which world building will overwhelm your storytelling is if your details are unspecific but voluminous. And you're using a lot of emotion words when you should be using words that do double duty or that describe actual things. Yeah. The smell in the room made her sick. Well, okay. That gives you the emotional reaction in the character's perspective, but the room smelled like rotting rats and raw sewage. Well, that would make anybody sick. Or, if you want to get her reaction in there, rather than letting your audience make that connection, her stomach turned as the smell of rotting rats and raw sewage shoved themselves up 
her nostrils. That gives you a sense of violation, a sense of nausea, a very, very clear picture of the smell in the room all at once. You want to look for those details and the way of phrasing them that does double and triple duty. And, and this is something that's worth practicing in short stories, too. These are some advanced level techniques that really move your fiction forward very, very effectively. But don't worry about leaving the reader to do it themselves, giving them room to create their own mental image. These are bad ideas. You need to get them out of your head. Your job as a storyteller is to overpower their sense of reality and create an illusion that they can't escape from and don't want to. That's your goal. Create that illusion and move them through that illusion with a good story and you will have done your job. With that, I'll see you tomorrow. NaNoWriMo Every Month is written and presented by J. Daniel Sawyer and produced by Artistic Whispers Productions. Visit our website at NaNoWriMoEveryMonth.com and leave a tip in the tip jar to support this podcast. NaNoWriMo Every Month is copyright 2015 by J. Daniel Sawyer and Artistic Whispers Productions and released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. <laughs>